then um, <laughs> and then I'm going to share my screen here. Give me just a second. Make sure I find the right one here. All right. Are you guys able to see my slides here? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. And let me just check to make sure we're recording. So we should be good to go. Yep. This is recording. Yep. All right. Well, welcome to all of you who are able to join us. And we're if glad you to have present, you today. If you, you might want to push present. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not going. Hold on. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the full screen now? Because it was. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So. Yeah. So today's topic is checking for understanding. Um, really, just when you're working with kids, how do you know that they're getting it? That they're understanding what you're talking about, the concepts that they're learning. Um. So. I'm Tina Souser. I've met most of you finally, and you, here's my email if you ever have any questions, and I'd be glad to help you. And, and I'm Steph Wanick. So, yeah, thanks for joining us again. And you guys are loyal viewers, so we appreciate that. Um, and so, formative assessment is really what we're talking about today. When you're checking students' understanding during a lesson, um, that that's formative assessment so it really is assessment for learning assessment um well we can probably click to the next screen we're really going to see what they're understanding what they still need work on so i'll go ahead and read this to you because i know screens are different everywhere since formative assessments are considered part of the learning they need not be graded as summative assessments or end of the unit exams and quarterlies, for example. Okay, so those are the two types, formative or summative, and we don't typically grade formative. Rather, they serve as practice for students, just like a, mean, just like a meaningful homework assignment. Uh, they check the understanding along the way and guide the teacher decision making about future instruction. They also provide feedback to students so they can improve their performance. Um, so an educational consultant, Rick Stiggins, who is kind of a guru, said, the student's role is to strive to understand what success looks like and to use each assessment to try to understand how to do better the next time. Formative assessments help us differentiate instruction and thus improve student achievement. So the whole time we're, you know, we're, we're teaching, we're always trying to monitor, hey, do they get it? Are they understanding what they need to understand? And formative assessments are those little checkpoints along the way that show us. So it could be a homework assignment. It could be, um, well, we're going to talk about lots of different formative assessments. It could be just a little check that shows you, yeah, they're getting it or no, they need more work. And I think one of the most important parts of this to remember is that it's a, a place for teachers and yourselves to kind of check in with students and then to make, um, whether it's accommodations or make changes for how the instruction is provided next time or, or what that looks for them next time and what extra information they might need or what they can move forward with. And I think that's, again, one of the most important parts. And I think the part with the students use it to improve their performance, I think that is underutilized. I don't think we always have students go back and, and self-assess or reflect um, as much as we should. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some important components when we're thinking about um, formative assessments. So they could be things that students do to demonstrate understanding. So they could show you a process. They could um, act out something or um, you know, show you the steps in something. Um, they could also verbalize their understanding and be able to say what they understand. Um, and they can also explain what they're still having trouble with. And that's a big thing for kids. We don't ask them to do that very much either. Um, and really to access or assess themselves and say, hey, I really understand this part, but this part is where um, I'm having some trouble and getting a little bit confused. And um, so some things you might want to do is ask students how they know something. Make them prove their understanding. 
So we can't just say, oh, how well do you know this from one to five? And they say three, and then we go on. That's not really going to help the kids. But if we have them prove what they know, um, then, you know, that's really getting deeper with it. And we can ask some clarifying questions like, how do you know that? Can you show me that? Um, do you understand this part of it, though? And that, that will help students. I think some of this, too, Stephanie, um, is the fact that you, you really have to establish a culture with the kids you work with, too, that it's okay not to know everything right away. It's okay to, to ask for help. It's okay, you know, those components where it's okay for us to, to say we don't know everything. Um, and it's okay to make mistakes and that mm -hmm. we'll all fix them together and that you're really there to help them. And that's the awesome thing about Paris, that you truly are there to help kids. And um, I know that they look to you um, for that help and assistance. So now we're just going to start with a bunch of different strategies you can use with your students to gauge their learning or their understanding. So one is thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, and students then, um, they rate their understanding by holding their thumb up, down, or to the side to show who needs more practice or help. So you can kind of look and see with your kids. So maybe you're practicing math facts and you ask the kids thumbs up, thumbs down, and they could either do a thumbs up if they feel like they really understand it, a thumb down if they really don't, or a thumb to the side if they're kind of in the middle. I really liked this piece when I was teaching um, because it was a really quick assessment and then I could take the groups that really felt like they needed more help and I could kind of bring them to, to a table to work with me and then let the others kind of continue on their own. So I was able to quickly assess on, on where they were at and then kind of put them into small groups to either work, uh, work on their own or work with a small group or then work on more instruction with me. And it took about two seconds. To mm -hmm. make that and I think here, just one component to take it farther is to ask them to explain which parts. You know, so if they have their thumb down, have them try to explain which parts are having trouble. And, you know, as teachers, I think we get sick of hearing, I don't get it. <laughs> um, we want to know what part you don't understand. So. And by asking them that, that will give you more idea of, of even what level they're at with the information. Mm -hmm. How to help. Yeah. yeah. So the next one is exit tickets. And there's multiple ways to do exit tickets. And I've seen some great, great ways in the classroom. Um, but this is where you just have students write a quick summary of what they understand before they leave class. And they could, they could write it on a post-it note and stick it up on the board. They could um, fill out digital post-it notes. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. They could um, use any form they could draw if they chose what they understand and what they're not understanding. But they, exit tickets then are a way for you as the teacher to go back and, and grab those. It's not so public for them to share with everybody. It's something that you can go back and reassess um, to help inform what you do next time with them. And it holds everybody accountable. So everybody has to write something down about what they've learned. Um, but you can also ask them a question on it. Like, I want today's essential question was this, you know, um, and I want you to answer that question before you leave class. And that's one of the big things about exit tickets, too, because you can bring them back to that main objective um, just to see where everybody's at with the understanding that you were trying to get across for the day. So another one is write it down. So this is a lot like the exit tickets, right? So you have students write an explanation of what they understand. Um, you could read them to help inform your instruction and write comments on them or discuss them to give student feedback. And where this differs a little bit from exit tickets, I think you could do this as a, a little bit longer of a writing where exit tickets, I kind of think, I mean, they can be many different things but I kind of think of that quick jot it down. This could be a little bit more of a writing piece where they're really showing their knowledge about a subject area or something like that. And you're understanding in the middle of a unit or, or in the middle of a lesson, hey, what do they understand and what do they not understand? 
And I, I think I see this one as more of a um, journaling type, just mm -hmm. kind of like you said. So, you know, pulling out those key points and, and journaling about them to see the depths of their understanding. When I was in the classroom, I really liked to do something like this to gauge like the learning of my whole class too. When, as I read them over, I could see, oh, is there something like the whole class is missing out on? Maybe I didn't put enough emphasis on that part of the lesson. Um, and, you know, then we can go back and reteach it. Individual whiteboards. So this is another example, and I actually use these quite a bit in my class, but this is where students have whiteboards, and, and I always have them just sitting right at the inside of their desk, and they could pull them out, and they could either, you know, answer a question on there for you, if you for a quick assessment, or um, you could ask them to, to label stuff that you're asking a question about. But again, if you have the individual whiteboards, they can hold them up as a quick assessment. Um, even as we did this with a lot with math problems, um, I would write a math problem on the board and then they would solve it on their whiteboards and hold them up. And you could pretty easily tell who was really understanding and who wasn't, even though they might get the right answer, um, but just identifying their whole thought process and those who maybe needed a little bit extra instruction just by what was showing up on their boards. And once Thing I did with them I used them a lot in my classroom too and I just think math and I'm um, also spelling my kids kind of didn't like spelling but when we did whiteboards they really liked it but um, in I always um, waited to tell them show me if they started to hold them up in the air and flip them to me too early some kids would go ahead and look at their neighbors <laughs> um, so I had a show me time and then sometimes I'd say look back look back or try again. And before I would tell the right answer, I'd have them rework the problem. Um, and I even heard um, a high school math teacher recently talking about they were actually writing on the tops of their desk with dry erase markers in the same way. And she said her kids were so engaged. So I think the same way whiteboards are good. Everybody has to do it and be engaged in it. And I kind of like that desk idea too, because then it doesn't become so public. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of walk around and individually ex assess um, rather than, like you said, the kids all looking at each other's boards. Because, yes, that does obviously mm -hmm. happen. <laughs> but the, the good part about that is you can usually know who is who is. Uh, yeah. Those better. kids need more work, right? Yep. Yep. Um, so we have doodle it. So it's just a quick drawing. Draw something. Um, you know, if you're in um, science working on the water cycle, maybe they quickly draw it or um, working on vocabulary words, drawing pictures for them. It's so powerful. So this was actually even I on the way down to Kearney t um, yesterday, I was listening to Dave Burgess's Teach Like a Pirate book, and he highly emphasized, you know, allowing them to draw because when you draw, it's actually a whole nother level of, of processing um, what's in your head and, and, and drawing it out or, or making a graphic organizer or something like that is actually something that kind of can show that higher order thinking and can really pull out some, um, not only creative skills, but also just being able to, to really identify what, what they're understanding. And you're, under, you're using both sides of your brain. So for the word definition, say if you're using vocabulary as an example, um, the word definitions on one side of your brain, you're using one side of your brain and for the picture, you're using the other side. And the more that we can get kids to cross over to both sides of the brain, uh, we just weave more pathways to them to remember. So. Yeah, and I think Stephanie, that's also an, another valuable point that when, you know, we have visual auditory and kinesthetic learners. And so when we tie the auditory to a picture for them, it's they're more apt to remember it too. And if they're drawing the picture, Mm -hmm. that he has even more powerful impact. Yeah, there are times that you can ask kid to, kids to select a picture online. However, there's just something about when our brain has to actually draw it that leads to better memory. Yep, absolutely. So another one is self-assessment 
cards and the students basically, and I've seen these on the desk, really just sitting on the desk and the students mark the level in which they understand the content. Um, I've also seen these used just with holding up your fingers, one, two, three, or four, um, where the students just really, and I like these different markers where, you know, number one says, I don't understand this yet. And then number four is all the way to the level that I can pretty much teach it to somebody okay. else. Tina, we're losing you a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, That's okay. I, I was just mentioning that I, I love this for the level of this because you not only get the I don't understand, but at the top, you go to the point of where I understand it so much, I could teach it to you. Um, mm -hmm. this, so it's kind of that one step beyond. And this is, some of your schools are Marzano schools. This is a um, very Marzano based strategy for kids to really think about their learning and think about what they're doing well and what they need to work on more. And that self-assessment is just really um, strongly tied to student success. And this is definitely something that you guys could do with your kids. I mean, even though you have a very small group that you're working with sometimes, um, you, could, you could have these pointers for them and then you could ask them to self-assess quickly. And, and as I mentioned before, I don't think we do enough of that. Um, and I also think that it's, it's hard for some kids because we don't do enough of it. Um, but I think this is something that you could definitely integrate into the kids that you work with. And then I'd say again, if a kid rates themselves as a one or two, we can ask them, what would you like to do or what would help you move forward with this? What's going to further your learning? Okay, the next is flip charts. So you might have seen these in some classrooms, but um, they're little flip cards, uh, flip charts that have a red, a yellow, and a green page. So red means I need help. Yellow means I can I need help, but I can keep working. Green means um, I'm I'm working fine, and students just keep them on the corner of their desk, and they get to flip them as they see fit as they um, change their status during the class. So if they're working fine, they have their green out, but they get to a problem, they might turn it to yellow to say, "Hey, teacher, when you have time, I need you to come over here." But if they're super confused, they might turn it to red, like I cannot go on until I have some help. And I think the other piece of this too is if you are working with a, a bigger group of kids and, and you're able to see these sitting on their desk, you know where you need to spend a big part of your time. Um, you kind of can make that quick assessment just by the colors that you see um, on their desk. So I think that this would be, I never used these stuff. Did you? I, I could I did see not. myself using I, them. Um, and I think that they would be very beneficial, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're, if you're working on a rather tough concept. Um, and you, mm -hmm. and this, are, I think this is something good to do when you're with a large group of kids. Um, you know, sometimes when we're working with smaller groups, we can kind of meet those needs. And as we are up moving about, um, with the class, but when you have a lot of kids to monitor, like say you as a para get called in um, to sub or to a larger group to monitor, that's, that's where it really helps out so that you can kind of see them as a visual as you're roaming around helping kids. Yeah, definitely. Um, the next one is fist to five and students basically rate them their understanding by allowing or showing zero to five fingers and they have the scale that just shows zero means that they understand nothing and five means that again that they could pretty much teach somebody else and I use this I use this several times and I could even see yourself using this as a quick assessment with just a small group um, just to kind of gauge where the kids are at and how they're understanding I even like to use this before I start teaching um, like maybe like what do you remember from yesterday um, that they remember a lot you know if it's a five I remember everything from it or a one or a zero would be uh, I totally forgot everything we talked about with this yesterday uh, it kind of helps me know where to start with a concept and the emojis are fun for little kids sometimes you do a happy face a straight face or a sad face for how they're feeling about their learning and the emoji one is very simple, could be a very simple resource for you to use and kids identify with these. So it'd be familiar to them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we have comprehension questions too. So this is just so valuable as you're going through something like um, whether it's a reading book or a science text or social studies or an article about something, just to really be asking some good questions while they um, while they read and um, you know gauging that learning all along the way to make sure they didn't get clear done with something and then they're completely lost. And I actually practice this quite a bit with my with my child. She's a first grader and of course she's just learning to read. And so for her, it's, you know, she's she's focused on the words, but what content is she getting? And so we'll stop it every couple pages. And yes, she gets a little frustrated. Um, but each time that we do that with a book, when she's taking her tests on them, she, she gets 100%. I think sometimes they get lost in, especially the younger kids, they get lost in the words because they're really trying hard to, to sound the words out. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily pay attention to the content. And that's where, you know, your piece can come in and, and just ask those content questions um, that they wouldn't be normally doing because they're, again, focused on pronouncing the words and making sure the words are correct. And if they don't understand it and they aren't getting these questions right, guiding them back to that text that, so that they have to look up the answer and find where that answer might be is really important for them. My kids in my classroom always knew if I said good readers, they'd say look back uh, because they really need to be guided to, back into that text to look it up. And then I would also really recommend that um, if you're working with a group, even of three or four kids, um, which is still a pretty small group, I would not have them raise their hands to answer questions. I would just call on them randomly. When we, when we ask them to raise their hand, we call on the kids who know the answers, and usually those are the kids who don't need practice answering questions. <laughs> if we call on them randomly, we make sure that every kid has to think about every question because they don't know if they'll be called on. So what I would do is I would ask my question like, Tina, what's the main idea of the paragraph? Or I, I'm sorry, this is the wrong way. Tina, what's the main idea about the uh, of the paragraph we just read? Because who's gonna think about it then? Just <laughs> Tina. <laughs> if I say everyone, I want you to think about the the main idea of the paragraph we just read. And then I could say, Ben, would you please share that main idea? Um, then everybody had to think of that answer and have it waiting in their head. I always would tell my kids, lock it up here, lock it up while, you, while we think about it. And then, you know, whoever would share out. Teach, okay, the next one is teach others. You guys still hear me? Yeah. Okay, I cut out there for a second, sorry about that. Um, have students turn and teach a partner the concept and then let's then the partner actually has to add more to what the partner taught so I this is awesome because I think this again goes to another level so if you have your kids talking to each other the first kid that turns and teaches the, the partner their concept then we might say it in a way that means something different to their partner and then by the partner making sure that they have to add back to that you're ensuring that both partners are listening to each other and understanding the content that they're sharing with each other and the fact that they're sharing it in their words um, may give the other person the opportunity to have a different level of understanding rather than what we can provide them up front mm -hmm. in the teaching moment and sometimes you want to just go ahead and have your like say if you have a small reading group that you're working with and there's four kids One's a partner A, one's a partner B, partner A, partner B. And they know who their partner is and they know their letter. So you'd say partner A and B, or partners turn to each other, partner A, teach partner B about this topic. Partner B then um, add anything to, um, to what partner A said. Or sometimes partner B just repeats what partner A said so that you make sure that they're really listening well. And you as their, as their parent or their, their teacher kind of listening in on the conversations to make sure that, you know, you're under, that the kids are getting the understanding and so that you're, you're following up with them even though um, they may not be talking directly to you. 
but you're still listening to the conversations. So we've been talking a lot about different tools that you can use um, for Check for Understanding, and there are a ton of technology tools out there that can help you with this. Um, and, and all of these that I have on here, these are all free tools for you to use. And even, I mean, you guys as paras could utilize them uh, as you wish as well, depending on what devices you have. But all of these on here that I've listed are basically multi-platform, which means that you could access them on a Chromebook, an iPad, a computer, anything that you want, and they, and they work just fine. So this first one is Kahoot, and each of these, if you're on our slides, if you click on it, it will take you out to that link. So if you click on the picture for each one, it will take you out to the website of, of where those are at. But Kahoot basically is a, a quiz tool, and the kids like it because it's very, it's kind of animated. There's Kahoot and quizzes um, that you could use, and you could just use it as a quick assessment tool. You could actually use this as a um, exit ticket if you chose. Yeah, you could just it's, a, it's a quiz game. It's like a, uh, playing a game, and um, it's timed, so that's kind of fun and exciting. And it has music, so the kids enjoy it. Um, it's just, and again, there's the Kahoot and Quiz is, and they're basically about the same thing. This one's got a lot more in there that's already created. So if you want, go check those out because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff in there already that teachers have created. And then this one over here on the right, this is called Plickers. We were talking a lot about how to hold things up to get a quick assessment. What Plickers does is it gives each kid has a QR code and each side of the QR code is a different level. So if they hold the side with the letter A up, that means they're answering A, um, turn it over, it's B, C, and D. And basically what you can do is you can have the kids hold up their Plicker card and then you take your phone and scan the entire room. And it and basically, I mean, if you're working with three or four kids, that's pretty simple. You take your phone and it takes you two seconds to scan that. And then you have a very quick um, assessment of what your kids are understanding. Uh, and you do have to go to the website and kind of, they have the cards that you print out for your kids and each kid has a name on them. So if you're working with two or three kids, you just basically go and have two, of, two or three of those printed out. Um, if you'd like more information about any of these, you just send me an email and I'd love to share some stuff with you. This Yo Teach is what's called a back channel. And we used to have a different tool um, that was accessible to us that went away. But this back channel, basically, if you're teaching something, um, your kids can be having a conversation with you while you're teaching. Um, and I know you guys, you guys are paras, but if you're working with a small group of kids and you want to make sure that you get all the content in, this back channel is a way for kids to kind of discuss um, the content that you're teaching them and teach each other. And it's just a, it's, it's a conversation flow. Um, and then when you're it's all done like teaching. We, wouldn't it be kind of like, Tina, if we had the chat open here on, on um, Zoom? Yes, kind of, but the content is, is more limited. You don't have as much, you don't have as much text for them to type, which is a good thing because if you want a, an assessment tool or a um, quick assessment tool, this would be a great one to go to. And like I said, it's just really a, a discussion component and it's very simple and it's an easy way when you're all done teaching you can go back to this discussion channel as the kids are working and go back and see the discussion and follow up with the kids that you might need to follow up with this last one this is probably my favorite tool um, especially for feedback and self-assessment for the kids flipgrid is a video assessment tool and the kids, you can actually set the time limit. So they are actually recording their face, um, talking about what they learned or talking about maybe however you want it to look. Tell me about what you learned today. Tell me what you do understand and tell me what you maybe don't understand. And it's just a quick assessment. And then when you go into your into your teacher platform of this Flipgrid, you get to watch every one of those um, videos and know how to respond to that kid when they come back and it's so quick and so easy to do the kids actually 
ones that I've worked with have loved using it as a tool. It takes them a while to get used to recording themselves, but I also think that that's an important skill that they need to learn as well. Even um, our whole staff used it. Um, it was at the beginning of this year. I uh, yeah, was. I think so. Yeah. And, um, you know, and we're older and, and it's hard to learn new tricks when you're a little older, but <laughs> we had a good time with it. Yeah, and it's it's so easy to use, um, and it's so easy to share it with your kids. And I know you guys are thinking, you know, I'm a para. Um, what do I need to ask my kids? Well, you could ask them any question. If you're, especially if you're working through a unit with a kid, you can ask them any question in here and just have them give you feedback. And I like the idea of ha them having giving feedback on their own learning, and then you being able to have a conversation with them based off of their video and their comments. So I really appreciate this tool. And there's so many more of these uh, quick assessment tools. I just kind of shared some of my favorite. Again, if you have any questions on any of these or you want to find another tool to use that would better suit your needs, please feel free to reach out to me. So we have thrown a lot of ideas your way in this uh, past uh, maybe uh, 25 minutes. <laughs> So um, we want to hear from you. How do you check for understanding? What are you currently doing with your students? Is anybody there? <laughs> They're all unmuted, so. No, we're not anymore. Oh, I can't hear us? Yeah. Yep. OK. Um, I've used the flip, uh, the flip grid in science, <clears throat> the science teacher used it and the kids Fine. didn't enjoy it what do you, do you think of the tool kind of, okay do you remember Sorry. what kinds of things they had to share about yeah they uh they built a um oh, what did they, they built something what, what did they built a roller coaster they built a roller coaster and then they had to show how they designed the roller coaster and how they built it and the tools they used for it so for me um when I was a teacher, I would learn a lot more about what my students understood by watching that video than I would by asking three multiple choice questions or something. And it was, it was nice that we could all then go on the computer and watch all of their videos. Mm -hmm. And then she had them go, she had each student um, ask a question about each video and, and critique the video that they saw. Awesome. And I bet, you know, even when you can share those with parents, it's such a great communication tool for the parents to understand what their kids are learning about. Awesome. Thanks. And yep. has anybody just, else, any other strategies you're using in your classes? I think quite a few of our teachers use cahoots where they make up their own questions. Mm hmm. Great. Do your kids enjoy those? Yes, very much so. And again, it's that way to add a little bit of something different to class. Um, Marzano also advocates using games in the classroom. So when we can do that, we break up the, you know, the mundane class with something a little bit fun. And at the same time, we're gauging what they're learning. Ben, is there something particular that you use with your kids? Oh. We're adding more and more blended learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, it basically, some of the stuff that we're using now, it kind of takes away what a para does because it does your job. <laughs> Actually, it, if yeah. it is having problems, it backs them up talks them through it, narrows their choices, asks them a few questions, and then it expands it. And if the kid it still isn't getting it, it sends a report to the teacher that you need to do some one-on-one -on -one with that student. Great. I will say you could never be replaced, right? <laughs> Parents are like superheroes that cannot be replaced. But that is good that, you know, you can get your whole class working. And, you know, maybe there's somebody who has an accommodation. They're doing something 
differently. Um, that you're working with them or, you know, you might take that kid who's been, had the report sent and say, okay, now we need to sit down and talk this out together. And, yeah. and honestly, with like blended learning stuff, I would be so thankful to have a paraprofessional in there with me because there's so many groups that would need the assistance and your help um, kind of evaluating. And, and Ben, for me, you know, you could be one of those self-assessment uh, people that help them kind of uh, self-assess what they're at and where they're doing and just being kind of that as the teacher is in somewhat a guide on the side, but having those extra hands in that environment is huge. So, so okay, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so what new strategy would you like to try? Did you learn any different strategies that, especially in reflection of the groups that you work with? Um, is there something that you'd like to try in the future? Okay, you're on. I just think some of that was due to lower grades, though. Big time. Yeah. You know, like the flip ones and the thumbs up and some, I mean, I The certain, thumbs up were yeah. the lower grades, yeah. The, mm -hmm. A lot of those that yeah. she first mentioned were lower. I mean, fifth and sixth maybe work with that, but I mean, high school, I don't, I don't see like the flip chart, fist to five, draw something, exit tickets. Some of that was geared to the lower. Yeah, that flip grade is geared to the higher unlike to the, you know, because mm -hmm. that was done in biology class. Yeah, I don't have Don't, no, don't count out some of those though for those older yeah. kids. Sometimes they like that quick way of showing to like exit tickets and post-its are used a lot in high school. Yeah, in fact, I saw one of the most effective uses of an exit ticket in, uh, it was a uh, science class, junior science class. And they were using the tickets the exit ticket very effectively because the teacher had a very quick assessment of where the kids were, but then she took and got the sticky notes that they were creating and she got even deeper into the levels of understanding for each kid. So I've seen those exit tickets work really well. And, and the journaling at the upper grades is huge and the drawing because I often would offer, cause I did teach high school very short time, but I taught high school. I, I gave them the option. Like, how do you want to show me your understanding for today? Do you want to, you're, you can draw, you can, basically I gave them anything. And that was truly an exit ticket, but it was also a check for understanding at their level. And I will tell you, those kids appreciated the fact that I gave them the opportunity to choose how to show what they know. And I had the best conversations with them from their creations or their design or whatever it is that they chose. Um, and, and believe it or not, some of them chose um, a video and some of them chose to journal and some of them chose to, to draw. It was, I got a variety. Um, some, there's a video on the teaching channel.com. I think it's .com. Um, and it's called My Favorite No. And so the teacher has the kids on a post-it solve a math problem, and this is for high school kids. I think this is a higher level skill. Uh, or I think middle school kids could do this too. So they solve a harder math problem on it, and she quickly um, goes over them as they hand them in and finds one that's wrong, and she calls it my favorite no. She puts it under her uh, document camera at the, begin or at the front of the class, and the kids have to write an explanation of why it's wrong. So and they can even write it or turn to a partner and say it or whatever. So it's kind of interesting to have them look at the problem that is incorrect and have to explain what the person did wrong. Does anybody else want to share what they would like to try? Even if it's one of the tech tools, I'd be glad to help you with those. But a lot of these has to be implemented by the teacher. It might. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead We're if you're working with maybe one student, you know, right at the end of class, just say, tell me, you know, maybe they're just going to have them tell me, tell me what you learned here today. Yeah. That's a benefit that you get of working, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. 
And, you know, if you have small groups, some of these, the tech resources and things like that can completely be facilitated by you if you so choose. Um, of course, you'd want to have a conversation with your cooperating teacher, but those can, you can have your account just like a teacher would. And some of those things like Kahoot, all they do is put in a code and answer your questions. Um, the Plickers, that's a very simple process to, to follow. And Flipgrid, you could have your own Flipgrids. Completely. And maybe even you can go back to the classroom and say, hey, we had this Zoom meeting today and I heard about this formative assessment tool uh, that we should try. <laughs> Yeah, and, and really, any, if you get a kid one-on-one, -on -one, that's awesome. And, and you're right, it's going to be more conversational when you have that one-on-one -on -one person. Um, but if you're working with small groups, any of these are adaptable to that. We also have some um, digital resources here. So these are just links you could um, click to get more information about these tools. This third one down here, I'll just point out to you, there are actually 26 short videos explaining some different strategies um, for Check for Understanding. So they're kind of, it's kind of a unique little page where you can uh, learn about the strategies and see, and see it in short clips. We do want you to save the date, um, our para training. This summer will be on August 9th. It will be all day uh, 9 to 3 here at ESU 8 in our newly remodeled building. I don't know if you can tell behind me, but it's not my old yucky office, but it's my new shiny office. So um, we're excited to have you join us this summer. Yes, and I will not be joining you this summer because I will be in a different role within a district. So as much as I've truly enjoyed working with all of you, um, I will be changing roles. So I Is everybody crying with me? <laughs> I'm crying. I get to be inside in a district, so I'm looking forward to that. But I'm sure this camp pair is going to be just as amazing because Steph's in charge. All right. Well, thank you, everybody who joined us. And thank you for those who are going to just watch the video later. Um, we definitely appreciate your guys' feedback. And if you have any questions on anything that we've talked about, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great end of the school year. I know things can get stressful and busy. And um, assessment time is here, but um, I know that your schools function better because of all of you. Absolutely. So, so hang in there. You can do it. And again, Boyd County, we're thinking about you with all those flooding. Thank, Thank you. you. See you. Bye, Bye, Bye. Bye.